Welcome to a Trek Sun Conversation. It's Tuesday in the 24th week of 2019, which means it's time for Talking Science. Dr. Brad Tucker is here. Brad, happy Tuesday. Yeah, how's it going? Pretty good, mate. Pretty good. It is uh, plugging away and June is rapidly uh, passing us by. Yeah, it's a... Uh you know, we um, just passed uh, a couple of weeks ago the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo 10, and it's only about, you know, five weeks or so to uh, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. So, you know, it's coming around quickly. It's absolutely incredible. It really is. And I'm very excited to announce that uh, in, in those five weeks' time, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Glenn Nagel from the Tidbinbilla Tracking Station uh, for a special look at Australia's role uh, in the Apollo program and also the future moon missions as well. That's right, because lots is happening and lots is happening uh, every day as we're talking about essentially, and it's a uh, uh, it's all happening up there, so to speak. <laughs> well, that goal of 2024 is uh, fast approaching, just as the months are flying by uh, here in 2019. Uh, and it looks like NASA's come up with a bit of a crowdfunding drive uh, to get them there. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a bit interesting because, um, you know, this issue kind of was highlighted, I guess, almost two years ago in that... In 2028, the current agreement for the International Space Station ends. And by current agreement, that's essentially funding model. Now, the, p- the two biggest shareholders are Russia and the US uh, in terms of paying. And both countries haven't necessarily renewed their agreement. And that doesn't mean they're going to pull out. And I think when the story popped up, they, you know, they said, you know, we're not pulling out. We're just we have to sort it out and, you know, plan for it. And one of the reasons is, as you just said, is a lot of money is being redirected to new things around the moon, like the new moon space station, the gateway. So how the international space station is funded in the future has always been a bit interesting, which is both the possibility of allowing maybe other countries to play a larger role, i.e. Australia, or potentially, and as they've announced recently, even private involvement in the International Space Station. And part of that private involvement, uh, they're opening it up uh, to some private citizens to travel to the ISS, but it's not going to come cheap. Uh, If I thought my US trip uh, forthcoming was expensive, uh, I I think I should uh, plan for a trip to the space station at $35,000 a night, roughly. That's right, and they do have a minimum stay. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And and this is the interesting thing, it's not just... SpaceX, they really want space tourists, essentially. You know, they realize private space tourism is here. It's a big thing. Um, All of the new, you know, interestingly, kind of the new space capsules being built, Orion, which is NASA's one, uh, Boeing Starlink, and SpaceX's Dragon 2, all kind of have lots of seats by lots being more than two. And so they're essentially saying, hey, you know, Uh, on future ISS missions, we're going to still be sending three astronauts like we do now, but there will be an extra seat. Why doesn't someone pay for that extra seat? Um, And the U.S. US isn't the first to do this. Russia did this um, almost 15 years ago now. They they, uh, allowed (laughs) the first tourist up on a Soyuz, and uh, the cost tag there was $20 million um, to get up instead of now what would be about the $50 million mark. However, uh, that was only for like a week, so there were much shorter stays as well. I wonder what you could do at the ISS uh, for for thirty days. Well, this is yeah, this is the interesting question. Is it is it like they're playing like playing astronaut where they're going to help with some of the jobs? Is it like they're outsourcing the work so you know someone pays and they still have to clean the toilets or something like that? I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, is it like a weird work experience type thing? It's it, I think there's a lot, um, you know, of, of the details there, and it will probably be a a custom trip per person. I, I imagine you would be able to take experiments up. I don't. I don't really know. Uh, maybe the flat earthers can fund sixty million to go see the Earth is flat. I don't know. <laughs> and then they'll have to explain why it's not flat. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very interesting thing. I, I don't understand what necessarily people would do, but I think, I think the bottom line is people will pay it. There will be someone who does. Mm, absolutely. Well, you, you might even say, Brad, that they'll take a rider 
on a rocket, <laughs> which segues us into uh, our next topic today, uh, which is Europe, uh, the European Space Agency working on a reusable space uh, transport system, an NSTS, if you will. Yeah, look, you know, we talk a lot about the US uh, and private companies. Europe is not out of it, right? They have been developing their own system. So they're upgrading their new rocket, essentially what they're going to call Vega C. Uh, and this will be their new um, rocket that it's essentially an upgrade to the Ariane 5, which they're using now. And they're also going to be the um, building essentially a space vehicle to take people up and down and cargo up and down, really, again, to be reusable, just as all these other capsules. So, you know, Europe saying, hey, you know, we're not going to be the only ones left out. We're uh, in it as well. So they're... You know, they're probably not as far along as say SpaceX or, or or NASA with Orion, but it's going ahead and it's going ahead. You know, it's fully funded, and the plan is, you know, I think that it could be in a few years' time. They haven't released a lot of details on the timeline yet. One detail that they have released is the uh, cargo bay size. They're talking about 800 kilos uh, capacity, which, I mean, is is nowhere near the 12,700 kilos, roughly, that the space shuttle could carry. But it's certainly um, quite useful, isn't it, to have to have that payload capacity as well as uh, uh, crude ability as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, again, th- this is going to be a much smaller version of the space shuttle. But that's kind of where everyone's going going in the sense that by making it a bit smaller, that's going to allow you to go further or faster. Um, So I imagine this will have the ability to get to the gateway to around the moon, but it can reach different, you know, inclinations. So it could do around the equator, it can get to around the poles, it could do some deorbiting maneuvers. Um, So it has quite a lot to it. And this will be built by ESA. So this will be open to the all of the ESA member states. Um, which is interesting for Australia in the sense that there's always been talk um, about um, longer-term relationships between Australia and ESA, even potentially joining as a partner, which would mean that down the road, if we join ESA or some agreement with ESA, that would allow Australia as a easy way of getting into space as well. It sounds really cool, and the idea was initially proposed in 2016, uh, but it's going to reach critical design review at the end of this year. So hopefully we can start uh, start getting some Europeans in space. We're going to have uh, private space tourists, uh, Americans, Russians. We just need the Aussies. Once again, we're... <laughs> We need to get some Aussie astronauts up there and, and maybe some space kangaroos. <laughs> that, that's right. So it'll be interesting to see, yeah, where Australia plays a role in this, given that, you know, there's so many different countries um, or groups vying it, and, and they're all willing for partnerships and overseas, you know, people to join. Um, and I think there's a lot of possibilities that Australia has to link up with one of these groups. And I think we will. I think something will happen in the next few years, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who that is and what that allows Australia to do because there is so much activity and, you know, it does require a lot of people, uh, and Australia has a lot that it can bring to the game. Um, though I do say writer, they do need to change the space writer name. It doesn't have the same ring. I don't know. No, no. Well, you well, got Dragon, you got Orion, and you got Writer, which is some terrible uh, contrived acronym. <laughs> and of course, I did forget to mention that the acronym is, it does stand for Reusable Integrated Demonstrator for Europe Return. That's right. Uh, it doesn't have I, the I same think- ring. No, I, I think that's a temporary uh, working title. That's right. Surely. I, well, let's let's hope anyway. Um, and I mean, look, as you said, it's been around for a few years now, um, and we should know a little bit more later this year about whether you know it will see a kind of a launch in a few years' time or has to be redesigned or something like that. Fantastic, Brad. Well, uh, as always, thanks for talking science, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. Don't forget, you can get early access to podcasts just like this one, as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes information by becoming a Trekzone member on Patreon. We're fast on our way to becoming a self-sustaining website, but we need your support. Become a member today and help Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek get even better. If membership isn't your thing, you can always keep up to date with Trekzone by following us on Facebook, Instagram uh, and Twitter, as well as subscribing to the YouTube channel and podcast feeds. Leave comments, react to posts. It all all makes us feel pretty good on the inside. Brad's doing the social media thing too. Find him on Facebook, Dr. Brad Tucker, and Twitter at btucker22. Or indeed, next week, right here on Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek, Trekzone. 